thanks for joining us today. Um, this is another session of, uh, of Yeg Biz. And today we're featuring um, Dan and Chelsea from KB Benefits, uh, talking about uh, your employee benefit package and all sorts of, uh, of interesting, but also important things to know um, when you're selecting, dealing with, um, you know, making changes to, or just renewing <clears throat> your benefits and how that kicks or uh, ties into uh, your employee package retention and, and hiring as Chelsea mentioned. So, um, so Chelsea was born and raised in Edmonton and she's got a certificate in human resources management with distinction from the U of A uh, and a chartered professional in human resources designation. She's got 10 years of HR experience followed by, or uh, with eight years prior to that, uh, service-related roles. And she's uh, passionate about exceeding her clients' expectations. Uh, Dan, Dan Kickham, uh, was also born and raised in Edmonton. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics with distinction and an MBA from the U of A. Uh, prior to co-founding KB Benefits, Dan spent most of his career in banking, uh, Royal Bank and CIBC, and served business and personal clients for almost two decades there, um, and uh, has a, ha a pattern of uh, building long-term partnerships with the clients that he works with. So Dan and Chelsea, take it away. Thank you. And it's nice, we, we have lots of familiar faces, so thanks so much for joining us, and hopefully we can give you some nuggets today of, uh, of information. Uh, Dan and I are pretty casual, as you've probably already seen. So please feel free, like as we're going through this, um, we wanted to treat it more like a conversation. And it's kind of nice having an intimate group because um, it's not an overwhelming amount of people that, uh, so jump in at any time if you have any questions. As we kind of go through this, we wanted this to be um, pretty informative for you guys and an opportunity to kind of ask us um, whatever it is you might have uh, uh, dying in insurance questions or benefit questions. So, And uh, I forgot to mention that, uh, that I volunteered to monitor the chat uh, box. So if you don't feel like jumping in because you're worried about interrupting or whatever, but you have a question and you want to throw it in the chat box, please do. And I'll make sure that, uh, that I monitor that and uh, get your question asked. Awesome. And we're, we're like not the most tech savvy people, uh, we'll be honest. So we've got our, we, we can see everyone, but we also have our presentation. So please just jump in and, and speak because um, we can't see everyone right now. So at any time, jump in. So we'll chat about, um, well, we'll t tell, tell you a little bit more about us, but we're going to go through kind of the, the basics of benefits um, and hopefully uh, can inform me on a couple of things. So um, thanks for the introduction, David, and, and giving a little bit of background about Dan and I, um, kind of our, our history career-wise. Um, I guess Dan and I met um, through, through our kids. I actually met Dan's wife before I met Dan. And so we were both kind of in this business doing it um, for other advisors at the time and thought, um, we could do this. We can do this on our own. And, and we kind of merged forces six years ago. Um, with the idea that we wanted to do it our own way. We wanted to provide really transparent um, information and advice and really get to know our clients, which is not, not necessarily how this industry works. It's kind of um, a bit convoluted in terms of, uh, of how it works. So with the intent that we, we wanted to truly put our clients first, we wanted to provide that transparent advice. Um, we've been fairly successful, I would say, in terms of uh, meeting that for our clients. I just want to say there's going to be a test on all that text on the screen <laughs> after the call. Uh, yeah, no, Chelsea and I met six years ago. We had a bit different backgrounds, but they're very complementary to the business. Um, I'm kind of a numbers-focused guy and was really interested in the insurance business. And Chelsea uh, is passionate about helping people and has an HR focus. So our complementary skill sets have worked quite well. And yeah, we've been doing this for six years. Um, she continues to tolerate me and things continue to seem to go well. Um, we, we specialize in helping all kinds of small and medium sized businesses in the Edmonton area mainly, but we have groups in BC as well and all over the province. Um, I would say our core customer group has employees kind of anywhere from from five to 100 employees, but we do have groups as big as 500 employees. 
Uh, yeah, and I think that's about it. You, we, we've we've given a bunch of talks before in, in different formats, um, but we find people most enjoy ones that kind of just give an overall understanding of what our business is all about and, and what we do and what our role in it is. Because uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of confusion about how this industry works, um, but there is there is a real method behind the madness, which we'll we'll go into in excruciating, boring detail today. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but I'll let uh, yeah, no, I'll let Chelsea kind of kick it off here. She's going to talk about why employee why benefits are important to your business, um, and and you know why. 24 million plus Canadians have group insurance coverage. So, so benefits, why they exist. Um, and as we talked about kind of earlier with, um, you know, the, the lack of finding talent and that's been kind of an ongoing issue, I think from when back when I was in HR, uh, full blown HR. So why do people put in a benefits plan? Why do they have a benefits plan? Um, obviously the attraction and retention piece. So, Back in the day, benefits were more viewed as a perk, and now they are an expectation. Employees entering um, in agreements with uh, an employment relationship just expect now employers to have uh, a benefit plan. So that has been a major shift. And obviously, the retention of staff, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some stats as it relates to that, but uh, highly important um, in terms of both attracting and retaining talent. Um, It's a tax-effective way to compensate compensate your employees. So, um, you know, when we look at an overall compensation package that involves many, many different aspects, salary being one of those things, obviously, um, when it comes to benefits, you know, should you give an employee an extra thousand dollars, let's say in an actual salary, obviously, when they're taxed on that, that extra thousand dollars is not a thousand dollars anymore. Whereas with a benefits plan, it's very tax effective. Um, and that thousand dollars is truly a thousand dollars when it when it comes from a benefits uh, standpoint. So, it's um, we found kind of more and more this um, in terms of that communication to employees and employee groups. Um, there was always kind of a misunderstanding in that. What does that actually mean, and why is it tax efficient? So we're finding um, huge value in that communication, and then keeping employees working. Um, and keeping them at work. So when they're when they're obviously at work, um, keeping them efficient, keeping them productive, keeping them healthy, keeping them well, and making sure that they have the accessibility and tools and resources to be able to do so. Um, so kind of big, big things, which I'm sure are not um, new to any of you in, in terms of your roles and what you do. Um, in terms of some, some t- statistics, <clears throat> uh, 86% of plan members agree that their health benefit plan is an important factor. Uh, when deciding on a job offer. We often get calls from our clients um, kind of as a a last minute, hey, can you send me the benefits booklet I'm about to offer an employee a a job? And they're they're questioning what's included in our plan. So I see Sarah nodding her head um, because I know you've you've definitely had that. So we often get those calls because it is important. Um, People are definitely, they're more informed in terms of what's available to them. They're more educated in that and they're asking those questions. So a uh, hugely important um, aspect of that. Uh, 71% of plan members agree that their health benefit plan is a strong incentive for them to stay with their employer. We hear this again often that, um, especially when it comes to families and dependents and um, that being important, of uh, uh, an important aspect, uh, making sure that they have accessibility to what they need. Um, that does keep employees from even looking because they they want to make sure that they and their family are taken care of. Uh, and then when asked when which compensation and benefits are most important, uh, employees ranked health benefits as the third most important factor uh, behind salary. And this one, I'd say, um, as of recently, now remote work options. So we're finding that more and more folks uh, now after the pandemic and having the, the flexibility of working remotely, that's become that's become important. So. Any questions? We'll keep on rolling. So uh, the benefit marketplace is a huge business. Um, Life and health insurers in Canada collected $123 billion in premium revenues in 2020. Um, The benefit industry uh, in itself um, is is dominated largely by three companies. uh, Canada Life, which was formerly Great West Life, Manulife, and Sun Life. 
So pretty much, I'm sure everyone on the call has heard of those companies and most employees have had some kind of interaction uh, with benefit plans from those companies. So they really, I mean, the, the group benefit space in particular is about a $45 billion, uh, $45 billion a year industry. And those three companies do 30 plus billion of it. So the rest of the business is scattered amongst a whole bunch of different providers, small and big. An example would be Alberta Blue Cross. Um, but those three companies really set the tone for what services will be provided, what the technology will be, what the pricing will be, um, all those types of things. And the, and the industry has a real methodology behind how the pricing works, how risks are insured, and everyone kind of follows lockstep with what, what those three companies are doing. Um, so I said uh, earlier, uh, there's 26 million Canadians have supplementary health insurance. About 24 million of those are covered through a group sponsored plan. Um, and, and going back to what Chelsea's previous slides stated about benefits or a perk, um, I read an article in the post last week that benefits are really changing from, from a benefit to what, what employees feel is a right. Um, and that, that not only goes for group benefit plans, but it also goes for what government benefits are like employment insurance, um, maternity leave benefits. A lot of Canadians are starting to view these things more as a, as a right, uh, as opposed to, to a benefit. Now there's, there's no, there's no hard and hard, fast rule. Like there's no law saying you need to have a benefit plan for your employees, but we know, um, and I'm sure you know that you're, you're, you're offering to any potential employee and attracting them is going to be a whole lot lower uh, if you don't have a benefit plan in place. So yeah, we'll keep going. So we're just going to talk about a little bit between what's statutory in terms of benefits and, and then what uh, is employer sponsored and kind of what those differences are. So average costs, we, we get this question a lot in terms of where should we be looking at as a percentage of payroll? So Average annual premium is 15% of payroll for smaller businesses and 30% for larger kind of across Canada. Um, I'd say in our niche of, um, of groups that we serve, it's probably closer to about 5 to 10%. Um, and that's just, Dan and I deal with more small and medium-sized business as we kind of had referred to um, before, but more so we're very strategic in terms of uh, sustainability of plans, which we'll talk about but really, really focused on what we're going to, what we're going to recommend putting into um, plans for, for our clients. So we kind of stick in, in kind of that five to 10%. Uh, spending on employee benefits is obviously a significant expense for anybody who's a, a business owner or obviously sees labor costs. Um, the average cost of providing benefits for a full-time employee is about $8,330. So huge cost um, associated with, uh, with having benefits. The, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention here is like, it, you need to kind of, the conversation, we're, we're working to change the conversation from looking at the benefit plan as a cost. It is insurance. Um, it is a cost. You are spending money on it. Um, but you need to look at it as compensation for your employees. It's an investment in your employees, and it's an investment that will hopefully keep your employees working and healthy and happy and engaged in your workplace. Um, so we, while, we, while we say that, we also have a real keen understanding of the cash flow or, or cost constraints of a lot of small and medium-sized businesses. So it doesn't help us to design a benefit plan, which is not going to be affordable for the business over the long term. Um, so from my banking experience, I've looked at the financial statements of hundreds of companies. I, I understand um, the cash flows of a lot of businesses. And even though I don't look at the financial statements of my customers in talking with them, I can often understand what their pressure points are. So we really work and we really listen to the customer to try and uh, design a plan that's going to help them attract and retain the talent they need while at the same time um, remain affordable for them and their employees so that they can they can utilize the plan into the future. Perfect. Um, so statutory benefits that are that are non-negotiables that uh, as an employer you, you have to provide uh, obviously workers compensation, employment insurance, CPP or QPP, uh, holiday and vacation pay. 
Um, and then there's the whole list of elective uh, employer sponsored benefits should they choose. So um, long list here, obviously, if you have exposure to any um, health or dental plan, um, or a, a benefits plan, you'll see a lot of these things uh, within a plan, we're starting to see some other kind of added, um, which used to be less common um, benefits, but are, are becoming more and more common. So uh, we'll quickly go, kind of go through this list, but from a life insurance perspective, um, we you have to have at least five benefits. I think I'm taking over your slide. Dan. No, I'm no, just no, talking no. right over you. You can you can take over the slide <laughs> as I do. As I do. <laughs> uh, depending on the size of the organization, so uh, I mean, insurance companies want to make money, right, and evaluate risk. So if you have a huge group, they will let you kind of pick and choose or do different things. Uh, for most of the marketplace that we work with, um, uh, all of the carriers or any providers can require that you have at least five benefits when you put a plan in place. So generally, life insurance will be part of that. So a standard life insurance benefit. Um, that's beneficial to both the employer and the employee uh, in that the employee is getting a life insurance package when many Canadians don't have one. Uh, and they're also getting a life insurance package uh, without having to qualify for it under any medical requirements so they could smoke seven packs a day and if they sign up and are on the plan they can you know they qualify for the insurance um, and that benefits the employer as well because it sets a policy around what you're prepared to do if you have an employee that passes away um, you have a policy in place that's packaged and provided to you by the insurance company around what will so you have to have five benefits. Generally, our plans include life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment, um, which is a type of life insurance, but also has benefits for all kinds of accidents as well. Dependent life insurance, which is generally a $10,000 benefit if your spouse passes away and a $5,000 benefit if a child of one of your employees passes away. Um, disability, um, a lot of groups have short and long-term disability. Uh, again, for the same reasons of setting a policy for the employer and protecting the employee, almost all of our plans have long-term disability. A lot of our plans for smaller employers do not have a short-term disability policy. Uh, short-term disability is a fairly expensive benefit, um, and this can also be covered through employment insurance from the government, uh, which covers the same period of time as a short-term policy. So unless it's kind of a philosophy of the organization that they want to provide short-term disability, a lot of our plans wouldn't have that. Uh, extended health care. So these are, this is the, one of the main benefits that your employees are going to care about, extended health care and dental. Extended health care would cover everything from prescription drugs, massage, physiotherapy, vision. Uh, it also almost always includes a travel, uh, emergency medical travel coverage, and then dental. Uh, dental coverage. So those are those are kind of the core that that all, pretty much all of our groups would have. Uh, right now in the industry, really topical um, or popular benefits are employee assistance programs. So this is a program that you can add on to your plan in most cases, or it, with some carriers, is included, where you where any one of your employees can call a one eight hundred number twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and immediately get access to a registered psychologist. So if they're having any mental health issues, uh, they can talk to someone, a uh, qualified person right away, and it's designed to keep people at work. Uh, critical illness is becoming more popular. Uh, and then the health spending or, or a wellness spending account, which just provides flexibility. Uh, we also have lots of clients with... Uh, with group RRSPs or, or pensions types of retirement benefits. Um, and then the indirect benefits or perks will often advise or talk to our clients about, but, but aren't really part of the benefit plan. Just a part of their kind of overall compensation as they look at yeah. everything as a total. So how costs are determined in implementing uh, plans? So what, what do we do? Uh, what do Dan and I do day in, day out? Um, we basically, we represent uh, our clients to the benefit marketplace. So, um, in, in the benefits world, as a small to medium sized business, the actual business can't go to the marketplace themselves. So if you're a business owner that you have, you know, 10, 15 employees and you want to put in a plan and you call Sun Life or you call Manulife, they actually refer you back to 
um, an advisor. We're called advisors. We're called brokers. We're called consultants. Um, uh, those are, they're pretty they're pretty kind uh, kind uh, things that we're called. But uh, I mean, we might be called other things. But uh, as far as we know, those are what we're referred to as. Um, and we then. Um, you have to have somebody representing you. Um, the only carrier that you can go direct to is, is Alberta Blue Cross. So that's, um, we all do the same thing. We all go and get the same rates from the same um, companies. And it works, it works similar to, to kind of your personal lines insurance, but a little bit different in the sense that um, there's only so many benefit companies that provide group benefits. So uh, you can only have one advisor working for you at any time. They won't quote against each other. So you can't you can't get a broker to get quotes from the same provider. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, all good. So we then take um, so new client is interested in putting in a plan. Our role is to put together, um, basically advise on what do we think, what what are, what's the intention of the benefits plan. Let's develop a plan. Let's let's um, put something together in terms of what's going to meet the needs of of your um, employees, but also obviously we want to make sure that the cost is. Um, in line with um, with the market, and we go out and we get quotes, and we um, develop a market analysis, and we compare those quotes, and we look at kind of apples to apples um, based on what's out there in the marketplace, um, and make a recommendation in terms of that plan design, um, who we would recommend for that client specifically. And we work with a number, as Dan had mentioned, we work with a number of different insurance companies, but we're very strategic with what makes the most sense given our clients. So, you know, are they a tech savvy group? Uh, and if so, we want to, that's, we're intentional with who we're going to recommend in terms of a, a provider for a tech savvy group versus, you know, blue collar workers who don't have the same accessibility to tech. So we're very intentional with that. Um, and then those initial rates, when we go and get those quotes are going to be based on um, age, gender, occupation, status, so single family status, number of plan members, um, and, and they're really just trying to do their best to determine what they feel like the group is going to use over that guaranteed uh, time that um, the, the, the rates are guaranteed for, which tends to be kind of 12 to 16 months and varying uh, depending on, on kind of the quote. So the insurance company is really just trying to do their best in terms of honestly looking through a magic ball and trying to decide what exactly they need to bring in in premium to pay out the claims for that group, knowing that they have no data, there's no historical data, there's no um, information in terms of previous claims or anything like that. So that's kind of the first initial get go. So, so Chelsea, what's it cost to get you to do this or, or how do you guys uh, get paid? Like, how does yeah. that whole thing work? Mm -hmm. So um, there is no cost when we when we take uh, our clients to market or we're advising. Um, there's actually no cost to our clients directly or even to a, a prospect or somebody that we're advising or working with. Uh, initially, we purely get paid when a plan is put in place and we get paid by the carrier. Um, so we're paid a commission from wherever the, the uh, benefit plan is placed. So whether it's Sun Life or Manual Life or Canada Life, um, we get paid through a commission from them as long as the group is in force. So you just pay the insurance company and the insurance company pays us. And, and because you have to use a broker, it's kind of automatically always embedded. Like there's nothing, there's no savings ever to try to do it yourself or anything like that. No, like the only, that's a great question, yeah. David. The mm -hmm. only provider that you can access without a broker is Blue Cross. So when the group and benefits industry was getting going, um, especially when it was getting going for smaller groups, which wasn't that long ago, it was kind of the 90s. Um, all of the major carriers made the decision that they didn't want to manage or pay a sales force. So they elected to sell through a distribution channel, which is the advisor network. Um, and so it's very well entrenched. Um, and, and, there, you know, and, and you have to deal with an advisor, it doesn't matter what plan. Um, they won't ever have an orphan account. All of the carriers will always assign an advisor to a particular account. Uh, so only Blue Cross will, will, uh, will sell direct to market. But the product they sell direct to market is is um, is really packaged so it has very little room for uh, for for customization also when they apply the methodology uh, for the pricing which we're going to get into a little bit later 
Uh, you'll find when there's no when there's no advisor or broker involved, they apply the most punitive methodology they can find. So the pricing's as high as possible. Um, so almost every instance, we've taken over probably 10 to 12 uh, direct Blue Cross plans since we've started. Um, and, and we've shown, you know, good savings to the group, uh, both initially and over time, simply because we get to look at the pricing on an annual basis and negotiate it based on what we know the competitors will do in the marketplace. And even with our compensation, it's better than what they're, they're willing to provide just as a package product. So, but on that note too, I mean, the other piece of, um, our commission is transparent. I mean, we, we are transparent with our clients in terms of what our, our commissions are, but it is the one thing like we don't get to make the rates. So often, um, our, our, when we're first initially working with a, a new prospect, they'll think, well, how, how do I get lower rates or what can you do for me to get lower rates? We don't actually get them. Um, it's, it's purely based on um, what we kind of already discuss, discussed in terms of the age and gender and occupation and all that good stuff. But we haven't discussed that yet. We're no, no, sorry. Those initial rates, those initial <laughs> rates. Oh yeah. Um, but the, um, the, you do leverage um, commissions and uh, Dan and I take a standard commission on, on everything. Um, we spend little, very little time focusing on our commissions, um, but advisors do have the ability to make their commissions whatever they want. And so as a consumer, um, you know, it's, it is in your best interest to know kind of what your advisor is taking in commissions, because we have run into commissions that are exorbitant um, and, and the advisor is very much overreaching in terms of what they're, um, what they're adding in. And, and then there is an impact, obviously, in the rates. So, um, yeah, it's uh, definitely um, worth your time to, to make sure that you have that conversation and, and that they have to be transparent. Like there's no, uh, it's in all the renewal documents, it's in all the initial sale documents. So, um, I would say from a consumer perspective, definitely worth the question. Thanks. All right. I'll let you flip. I'll flip over to the next one and you can talk about. Okay. Renewal. So now we're going to determine uh, how the pricing goes. So uh, all benefit plans are made up of two main types of benefits. One, one group of them is called the pooled benefits. And the other group is called the experienced rated benefits. So the pooled benefits are benefits that uh, are, are uncommon, not, they're not often paid. And when they are paid, it's generally a large dollar amount. So the benefits in a benefit plan that, that form that are life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment, dependent life, long-term disability and critical illness. So these claims wouldn't be paid every year, depending on group size. Um, and uh, when they are paid, they're generally for a large dollar amount. So the way these, these are priced is it's, it's based on risk. So you can think of it kind of like your car insurance or your home insurance. So the insurance company takes the age of all of your employees, the marital status of all your employees, the occupation of all your employees, uh, and an actuary would stick it into a bucket and it would determine a risk uh, uh, calculation and then a rate per amount of insurance for each one of those uh, for each one of those uh, benefits. Um, so if you have a bunch of employees who are 20 years old, your rates for life insurance and disability are gonna be far lower than if you have a bunch of employees who are 55 or 60 years old, uh, just because the, the likelihood of them passing away at 20 um, or becoming sick or hurt and not unable to work are far lower than for an older group. And so what we see generally with, with pooled benefits is the rates slowly tick up year over year, uh, provided the employee group is stable uh, because the employees are just getting older year after year uh, with the same group. Uh, but if there's a lot of turnover um, or if something changes in the marketplace, you can see those rates go down uh, as well. Uh, so the next one, can I do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. I was gonna just add sure. to the way we typically try to, to kind of put that in um, just for ease of memory in terms of how those are determined. We, we talk about it kind of relating it to house insurance. So um, those are benefits you obviously hope to never have to use. Those 
you know, life claims or accidental death and dismemberment or even disability claims. But think of it like house insurance, um, true insurance in the sense that if your house burns down, it doesn't mean the insurer comes back next year and says, OK, well, now we need to collect six hundred thousand dollars from you to rebuild your house. So um, that those kind of areas um, are really the only time you kind of make money in insurance. It sounds terrible, but uh, unless you die, you really don't make money in insurance, but high cost payouts and they don't come back to to, uh, you know, collect based on that. They kind of look at it as an overall pool of, of um, claims and, and obviously insurers. No, I always make a joke about group benefit pricing because I used to work in banking. So uh, mm -hmm. in, in banking, the bank will come out to your business and give you a big pile of money. And then over time, you'll give the bank back that money plus some more money in interest. With group insurance, it's a bit of a better business because you give the insurance company money now and they're going to give you less money back to you and your employees at some point in the future. Now it's, it's kind of glib remark, but that is essentially how the business works. Now there's a lot of value built in around the transferring of risk for your employees and setting a policy and the tax effectiveness of the compensation, but that's really at the, at the core, how the business works. Um, so the, the other kind of benefit in a benefit plan is an experience rated benefit. And so this is really priced. And so this is what's going to be most important to your employees, mainly the health and dental. Um, it's going to be most what they, they, they're concerned with. Uh, and, and it also makes up the, the lion's share of the cost of the benefit plan. Generally, it's in kind of the 65, 70% of the cost of the benefit plan has to do with the health and dental benefit. And so there's no real, it's not rocket science how they price these benefits. Essentially what they do is the insurance company will look at the amount of health and dental claims your group had over a 12 month period. They'll factor on an inflation rate to, the, to those claims and then they'll factor on their profitability and administration charges and our commission. And then they'll say, here are your rates going forward. And generally for a really small group, like uh, five people, they'll look to pay out on any given year about 72, 73 cents on the dollar. Uh, for, for a bigger group, that, that will climb to as much as 90, uh, 90 cents on the dollar. Um, but what we see every year with every renewal, even though this methodology has been developed by the insurance industry, and is in present and it's in all the documents they give us at the renewal the insurance companies always try to overreach they always try and collect more in premium um, than their own methodology states so a big part of what we do is we analyze the group we analyze the claims experience over the given year we look at what the fair pricing is both stated in the renewal from that carrier and what we see from our other customers and then we will negotiate your rates based on based on the usage so, yeah, that's a big part of obviously our job and our value. Um, and when we talk about, you know, you can go direct to Blue Cross, but Blue Cross isn't going to negotiate your rates with themselves. Um, so we we often get the question like, you know, do plans always just keep going up and up and up? And, and I know it may seem that way. They don't. Um, there is methodology and our job is to really um, to, to educate and really justify where it should be and, and explain that to our clients. So um, often uh by sitting down and having like a quick five minute conversation um especially uh when it comes to well this is how many claims you had and this is how much they paid out and if you, you know you're a business owner and if you paid out uh more in in expenses than you brought in in revenue you also would be not in business anymore so um generally it's pretty straightforward but uh typical renewals like i mean our goal is is the sustainability of plans and really our goal is always to kind of have you know kind of a 10 percent and under uh in terms of of change in 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 rates um we want that consistency we want that um sustainability and that stability for uh our groups because we also know it impact it impacts uh your your employees as well and having those conversations uh isn't easy and we want you to understand where the rates are coming from and where the money is going because an important conversation you can have with your employees is is what is going on with your plan because you are delivering the compensation to them in the form of the benefit plan so it's really important to us that you understand um what the plan is 
paying for and, and how the how the employees are utilizing it. Two, two quick questions. Um, just going back to the pooled uh, plan. Uh, is there ever, I know you said that it's not based on the experience. It, does it ever creep up or change slightly because of experience or it should never, like if I had a, an employee claim, you know, life claim last year or two years ago, would I see an increase or I should not see an increase because of that at all? You shouldn't see an increase based on the methodology at all. Yeah. Um, but we do not with life. Uh, they're, they're pretty, they're all insurance carriers are pretty comfortable paying life benefits uh, because the liability is known uh, and it is a fairly unlikely event. Uh, Long-term disability is a bit of a different story, uh, mainly because it's, it's very hard for the insurance companies now to price long-term disability because the liability is unknown. Um, so uh, you, if you had a person go on long-term disability, they could be on it for six months or they could be on it for 30 years. Uh, and the insurance company is responsible for paying those claims. Now, their methodology states that it shouldn't affect the rates whatsoever. Uh, but we do see that if you, we do see cases where uh, if a group seems to have, um, you know, a less than typical amount of employees going on long-term disability, that, that the carrier will start to price that benefit fairly punitively. So um, even though their methodology states that they won't, that's, we do see that. Okay. Yeah, I was curious. Yeah. And, and, and on the creep question, there is, there's in gen like general creep of those pooled rates does go up. Um, and, and again, part of what we do is strategically marketing our plans um, for our clients kind of every three to five years to make sure that those are in line with the market. Um, because we do see that. We do see kind of that little bits of creep um, year after year. So. And it's likely most people on the call have seen increases in their long-term disability rates, especially in the last two years. Um, and, and there is good reason for that. One, throughout the pandemic, all the carriers saw more long-term disability claims than they had seen before. Uh, so that was one issue. Another issue is they were collecting uh, because of a lot of layoffs, especially mm -hmm. at the start of the pandemic, they were collecting less premium right. uh, to pay the benefit. And then the third major factor was the huge, a lot of the reserves or all of the reserves for long-term disability benefits have to be held in fixed income investments. Um, and when interest rates uh, were, were lowered so dramatically at the start of the pandemic, um, the returns that the insurance companies could earn on their reserves to pay the claims uh, dropped dramatically. So they were left, uh, all, all were left increasing rates. So, and, um, and I don't know if this is the place for it, but, or maybe you'll, you're still going to talk about it. But sure. I know some plans, uh, there's a difference in employer versus employee. And uh, I can either pay all of it as the employer or I could pay 80 and they pay 20 or I know there's also some tax implications on the life and the disability and that sort of thing. So any anything to, I guess, comment there? Yeah, definitely. So the most common split, we get this question often. Um, the most common split is a 50-50 split still. Um, so the employer pays 50% of the premium and the, the employee play, pays the other 50%. Uh, over and above that, so we have clients that kind of do everything, um, you know, kind of some do a 60-40 a split, some do a 75-25 split, uh, depending on kind of their industry, the competitiveness of their market, um, you know, their, their kind of recruitment and attraction um, uh, goals and, and what they're trying to do there. But um, in the sense of the tax efficiency, we will we always make sure that it is um, set up tax efficiently because you're right. Certain benefits um, have tax implications if the employee is paying or if the employer is paying. So we always want to make it as efficient as possible. And, and we advise a, a certain way of doing that for sure. Yeah. So like, I mean, just so so the listeners know, I mean, the insurance company is going to reach in. So the way a benefit plan works is they'll give you an aggregate premium on a monthly basis based on the amount of employees you have. Um, then they're going to reach into your company bank account once a month and pull out the full amount of the premium. Then if you do a split with your employees, it's your responsibility as, as an employer to take back uh, the employee portion via a payroll deduction. 
Uh, most of our groups do a 50-50 payroll deduction, and that works really well uh, because the 50% the employees paying via payroll deduction covers the cost of the life insurance and the disability insurance. So there's no tax implication to the employee if he were to receive these benefits, which is as the benefits are intended. If the employer pays for the life insurance premium, that's fine, but it's a tax, it's a tax, uh, um, it's a taxable benefit to the employees. So they have to pay tax on the premium if the employer pays it. Uh, for the long-term disability, uh, benefit the way it's supposed to work is if the employer pays the benefit, um, the employee gets the benefit after they pay tax on it. So it doesn't really work in the payout the way the benefit is generally uh, generally uh, set up. Uh, but sometimes that's the way the employer wants to do it. So they cover 100% of the cost of the plan and then they just increase the payout on the long-term disability. Uh, and discharge tax on the premium to the employee for the life insurance. So that's fine. We also have groups, uh, like nobody's checking the, employee, the insurance company. All they're going to do is take the money out of your corporate account. I know we have groups where they charge their employees for more than 50% uh, of the plan. Uh, the contract will say that the employer has to pay 50%, but, uh, but we really see everything all over. But a good rule of thumb is to do a 50-50 cost share. That not only helps the tax situation, but it also um, it, it, it provides employee engagement into the plan, which I think is important, especially for smaller groups, um, because then you can have a conversation with your employees that they use the plan if the pricing is going up. And we see with smaller groups, if there is... Uh, uh, an employee pay portion that there's less abuse of the plan as well. So, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think that covers it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it kind of leads us into uh, uh, the sustainability of plans, um, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and having that cost share obviously uh, helps with that um, because it's not uh, all on all on the employee or on the employer. So this is a big, um, obviously because it's such a large expense, um, our goal is always to have um, the intent with the, with the benefits plan being that it is sustainable. Um, we never want to put a plan in place with a, with a, a client that uh, we know is set up to, uh, for failure. We want to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're strategically doing um, for, for the longer term. So what affects uh, the sustainability of benefits plans and those pricing, obviously adjustments and cuts in government health care. So when we see that, that just shifts more responsibility onto these private or employer sponsored plans, obviously. So when our provincial health care takes, uh, takes things away from what's generally covered, um, that just means those, those types of claims are going to be starting to run through um, these private plans as well. So, and that impacts, that impacts obviously the usage and the amount of claims going through there. Disability claims is huge right now, as Dan had mentioned. So mental health issues. So 59% of working Canadians report that they've experienced a mental health issue. Um, that's a, obviously a substantial uh, amount. And these claims, mental health claims um, tend to be reoccurring. So this isn't, you know, I, I hurt my arm, I couldn't go to work and I was off for work for two weeks and now I'm healed and I'm back at work. These tend to be kind of coming to work, off of work, coming back to work. So very, very reoccurring and then end up um, often in uh, more of a physical uh, ailment as well. So that's what they're starting to find. So mental health claims, um, by far the most frequent type of claim, um, double that of the next um Mo the second most, which is cancer. And that, that is definitely shifted in the last number of years. Um, I know Dan had already mentioned interest rates being at historical lows and obviously that impacting. So we've had groups of very, very large um, long-term disability rate increases. And that's not because they have a bunch of people on long-term disability, but just that pool as a whole and the claims that are going through there, everybody kind of pays for. On the extended health front, um, obviously drugs, um, prescription drugs, there's more drugs available than ever before. There's more high cost drugs, um, especially high cost medications that are coming to market and that are coming to market. And I'll let Dan, you, you have good examples of this, but are being used um, really high cost drugs being used for more uh, as, as therapies for more and more uh, diseases. So um, the uh, um, psoriasis. Oh yeah. yeah. So um, there, yeah, there's lots of high cost medications coming on the market more and more. 
uh, and more and more coming all the time. Uh, a big proponent of what we deal with all the time is, is a kind of drug called biologic drug, um, which doesn't cure any condition. Um, it just manages symptoms. So it's an excellent recurring revenue stream for the drug manufacturer because once you start taking it, you can't really stop taking it. Um, and I know well, I know these drugs really well because I have I have a chronic condition called Crohn's disease. So I've taken many of the biologic drugs um, that they use for Crohn's disease. Uh, so names that you might encounter when you do your benefit plan are Remicade or Humira or Stellara. Uh, but they're also starting to use these drugs and have been using these drugs for all types of other immunocompromising uh, conditions like arthritis, uh, MS, um, uh, cystic fibrosis even, and, and now they're starting to use it even for psoriasis. Uh, and so these drugs can cost, you know, as much as $50,000 a year, which can have a, with, which can have a big impact on your plan. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking at the claims of the groups that we work with to manage these costs. There's other resources in the marketplace, government plans that can help your employer plan or take over the cost of, your, of, of these drugs for your employer plan. Um, so so we're, we're working with those all the time. Cancer medications, kind of the same thing, diabetic medications. Yeah. Um, so it really pays to have an advisor that knows um, the marketplace, uh, and, and can do the research to see, you know, what drugs your plans are paying for and whether or not there's a more efficient way, uh, to get the employee, the coverage they need, um, with, without, uh, impacting the claims experience of your, of your employer plan. Yeah. A lot of what we do is just help navigate, um, and, and help navigate our employers, obviously, to, to be able to still provide, um, coverage and accessibility, but but help the plan members, the employees, uh, to navigate kind of the system and figure out, you know, if we if we need to make some adjustments and changes in terms of the benefits plan, um, how do we continue to make sure that you have access to what it is that you need um, without impacting the entire plan? Because obviously, a fifty thousand dollar drug claim on a ten person group is drastically going to impact the sustainability of of the rates for that for that group. So. Um, and I'd say the other thing in terms of extended health is, uh, although not over the last two years, but uh, out of country claims. So travel claims tend to be, especially in the States, very large. You spend a night in a hospital, um, you're, you're facing kind of a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 uh, bill just for an overnight stay. Um, so we've had, we've navigated a ton of, um, of out of country claims and, and that's truly where the insurance exists and it's good to have that protection but um, that impacts the sustainability of plans not not in the same way as a, as a direct cost and impact but overall in terms of um, how these are priced in that pool of, of um, cost it, it does over uh, over time definitely impacts and we're seeing yeah a lot of out of country claims and carriers are aging workforce um, and then a lot of, a lot of the groups we deal with are owner operators and they spend a lot of their time in the wind, in the South, in the winter. Um, and group insurance is an excellent way if you own a company to have out of country coverage, cause it has very few exclusions, meaning that it's really good emergency medical travel coverage. Um, and it's, it's very low cost. So um, if you're if you're an owner operator of a business, it's an excellent travel policy for you to have if you if you do spend a significant amount of time in the in the U.S. Sorry, we've got go uh, we've got two or three questions. Um, I'm going to skip Corinne's for now, and if we have time, we'll come back to it on the tax side. Um, but sure. Don's got one that's almost ideally suited for your first point there, I think. So, Don, did you want to ask your question about uh, Blue Cross? Yeah, sorry, it's a little bit convoluted, but uh, the, I guess the question is, if, if somebody's on Blue Cross already, then they switch to a plan that the company offers, uh, it, should something happen and they leave or the company's happen, something happens to the company and they can no longer stay on that plan and they want to go back to Blue Cross, I've had it expressed to me by a couple of people that they have a concern that they would then not qualify for Blue Cross as they did initially because now they've got some pre-existing condition that Blue Cross disqualifies them for. Is that like a real thing or is that just somebody being paranoid? 
it, 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 it can be a real thing, but it's mostly somebody being paranoid. <laughs> so it, to, the, the best way to look at it, if somebody's on like a Blue Cross personal plan, uh, first off, the coverage under that plan, um, if you look at it, won't, won't be very good. It won't be, in, in almost all cases, won't be nearly as good as a group plan. Uh, any personal plan that you sign up for, whether it's with Blue Cross or any provider, if you go through the details of the plan, really what it is is a budgeting tool. So the plan will have caps for every single benefit, including prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And the caps on the benefit will limit the individual from claiming um, more than they're paying in premiums over the longer term. So a group plan will have all kinds of coverage for, 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 for drugs that that could allow them to claim benefits far and above what the premiums are um, because that's the embedded coverage in the group plan. Uh, Blue Cross though will reserve the right if, if they go on the group plan to not allow them back onto their private plan, um, it, but they could refuse entry of anyone onto a private plan at any time. All group benefit plans, though, to kind of what you can use to tell your employee is all group benefit plans, and I'm sure yours as well, Don, will have a, a carry-on option. Uh, so what that means is if you have an employee that leaves your organization, um, they can make an election within 30 days to keep a benefit plan through your provider. Um, so I don't know who you're with, but all providers will have a personal policy of their own. And so any employee leaving your plan will guarantee to get a personal plan through the provider you're with right now uh, when they leave your group plan. Okay, thanks. That helps. Yeah, yeah. no, no yeah. worries. All right. And I know we have less than five minutes, so I'll just, uh, but Corey had a really quick question as well. Sure. Corey, did, yep. you want, did you want to ask that or would you like me to? We don't have tons uh, left in this anyway. So yeah, go for it. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I just wanted to know kind of if, if you saw any trends throughout the pandemic of kind of the shifting of cost sharing on these benefits plans. I know you mentioned kind of 50-50 being standard or some of them, you know, 75-25, depending on uh, industry and remaining competitive. Did you guys see any shift throughout the pandemic, maybe more towards the employee or if there was any changes? No, to be honest, it was interesting. Um, I would say not not a shift in terms of cost sharing. I actually found, um, we actually found, I'd say there was a lot of layoffs. Like I, obviously there was a lot of um, things were shut down and, and um, a lot of our employers were having to lay employees off, but they actually really wanted to take care of their employees. Um, and we found that in lots of circumstances, they were actually taking care of more premium than, um, than, than they would have under normal circumstances. So, um, I didn't, ha I know I didn't in my, in, in the, those that I take care of, didn't have anybody, sh uh, shift any more cost onto the employee. I'd say they actually went the other way and wanted to really take care of their employees, um, to make sure that they had accessibility during the pandemic to whatever it was that they needed, um, obviously within their, within their means. So, and I've, I've not seen anything since then. Um, if anything, now it's kind of even more so from a talent and, and acquisition of talent uh, perspective. I'd say employers are doing even more than, than two years ago um, because they have to. Uh, my comment would be, yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. My comment would be in any kind of contracting business environment, it's tough on the benefit plan because what we saw at the start of the pandemic as an example is um, you, you have a bunch of layoffs. So what happens is the company lays off a bunch of employees. Um, but so their premium drops because of the number of people they have paying premium, you know, goes down. But generally the people they lay off are younger, single, non-claiming employees. And the people they keep on their workforce are often more senior family or claiming employees. So the premium goes down. Uh, the claims stay the same, or sometimes they even increase because a lot of people will go make claims um, if their if their fellow workers getting wor laid off or they're worried about getting laid off. So in those cases, you know, companies are in a, a contracting business environment, and at the same time, often group benefit rates need to go up to cover what the claims are are in in the business. Um, so I didn't see we didn't see. Uh, 
uh, employers saying, you know, employees need to pay, um, you know, a bigger portion. Uh, what we saw a lot of coming out of that actually was employees or employers started to enhance their plans as they wanted to attract um, those employees back. Uh, so we, we have a lot of employers putting in place employee assistance programs to help with the mental health of their employees. We have a lot of employers putting health spending accounts in place um, or retirement plans in place. Uh, really designed not only to attract the employee back, but to to, to make them uh, want to stay. So it was kind of an interesting process. We were we were really busy because it was nonstop questions about plans, especially with benefit entitlements during layoffs. Um, and then now it, it's it, uh, but our our business was actually shrinking because the amount of people on the plans was going down. Now it's it's kind of turned the other way, and our plans are growing. Uh, but the good what, what's been good for us is that employers are, are, adding, are adding to their plans. Um, so that's a really long-winded answer. But at the end of the day, no. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of employers saying, you know, my employees are going to pay a bigger yeah. portion of this yeah. um, through the pandemic. So We're, yeah. uh, we're at 1 o'clock or actually just after 1 o'clock. Holy I mean, moly. Some have, had, some have had to leave already. But uh, did okay. you guys, uh, are you able to wrap up in the next maybe two or three minutes? And we'll yeah, you bet. Time. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, just as we talk about cost controls, uh, and, and a lot of this we've already gone over. So really where we kind of focus on in terms of uh, that sustainability and, and strategically um, providing advice to our clients is looking at the usage reporting. This is what we do all day, day in, day out. It's, it's really not exciting for anybody else, but we really enjoy it. Um, and we try to navigate that, um, those other options and, and really kind of tailor make um, some suggestions uh, so that we can provide those cost controls. So uh, navigating those other um, programs, looking at usage reporting, typically we can catch things before they become a big impact or a big issue because we're watching it on a regular basis. Um, lots of different things we can do with the plan. We never want to cut and slash benefits. That's never our go-to, but we look at kind of different ways to, to modify the plan to kind of still offer a high level of coverage, but obviously, uh, limit the exposure, uh, and the liability from a cost perspective. And then we strategically market our plans. So whenever we, uh, whenever we kind of feel there is some creep or there's, um, opportunity in the marketplace, um, we intentionally will market our plan kind of every three to five years for our clients to make sure that those costs are kind of in line. Um, and then lastly, kind of what's new in the benefit world, um, we can go over this really quickly and, and happy to answer any other questions. Please feel free to reach and out to us. And we talked about so a lot of it. A lot of it right. we already did. But yeah, yeah, we've got an aging workforce. I mean, providers are offering way longer termination ages than they used to because they have to, because employees are working far longer than they used to. Um, lots of flexibility. We're getting a lot of questions. Employees want flexibility in their plans. They want to make sure that they have accessibility to what's important to them. Um, recruiting, uh, it tends to be, uh, this, this comes up obviously, uh, in terms of, uh, what else can we be doing? Uh, the expectations of, of employees is very high right now. So, um, we get a lot of, a lot of questions in terms of how, how to best suit the, the plan to recruit and attract and, and retain that talent. So, on that note, we'll, we'll leave you guys and, and sorry for running a bit over, but um, we're happy to, to chat. Please reach out to us. And I know this is going to be shared, I think, and, and sent out to those that were able to join us, but um, happy to connect and uh, see if we can help you or at least provide some uh, information for you.